Hello and welcome to the Oral Apothecary Podcast, authentic chat about medicines, pharmacy and healthcare in the UK. Pharmacists Jamie, Gimmo and SDC take on topical and controversial stories but keep it edgy yet light-hearted. Podcasts share their desert island drugs and joyful patient stories. Welcome, this is the Oral Apothecary Podcast. My name is Jamie Hayes. Welcome to episode 10, the final episode of series two. This week we're joined by Dr. Mark Holland. Mark is Associate Professor at the University of Bolton and former President of the Society for Acute Medicine. Mark will get to share his Desert Island Drug, a career anthem and recommend a book for the Oral Apothecary Library. Our micro discussion this week has an end of term feel to it, so we've been able to bring in some board games and top trumps. STC has brought in Mousetrap but has lost the ball and Gimmo has bought in operation but is missing the elastic band the funny bone and the wishbone are they just my school memories i don't know but before we get to play we'll be discussing with mark some of his and our memorable medicines moments i feel a new feature coming on there first let me welcome my two fellow apothecaries stc is in bournemouth and gimmo is in cardiff welcome both evening very excited tonight go on well last episode of series two isn't it it is (laughs) I must just start by saying I heard a great phrase. You know, we love a bit of a phrase on here. So this was a transformation manager who works with learning disabilities and mental health. And you'll love this because it plays to your story that I know we won't have time to talk about around (laughs) Julian Tudor Hart. We were talking about how to stratify patients to try and find, you know, the ones that we needed to who've got long-term conditions. And she said, we need the needy, not the noisy. Even if you paid me, I'm not telling you my Julian Tudor Hart story now anyway. So, Well, anyway, I thought, you know, listeners, we like our little phrases, don't we? So there's that. And the other thing I must just say, although I've not been a big fan of drugs and pets, it has really caught the listener's imagination. And so again, you can't make this stuff up. But literally, I got home on Friday to discover my daughter in tears. She'd been to the vets with my wife. And we've got two King Charles Cavaliers. And one of them, Missy, bless her, who's, you know, full breed. And she's a about 11 we know she's had a mitral we you know she's got a valve problem with her heart because a lot of them have and anyway apparently they'd been and she started coughing and she didn't want to go for walks so you know what's coming now so <laughs> they go to the vet you know oh they need to see the cardiologist they need to have a scan we need to start pimabendin which i did know about it's a positive inotrope anyway i don't know why i'd obviously just got in from work and i said to meg she said well we must have this medicine for the dog for missy because you know she's going to live longer that's what the vet said and i said well the thing is meg <laughs> You know, we need to look at the options. She's lucky to have you. Yeah, and so I was like, well, what do you mean options? I said, well, one option is do nothing. She said, what do you mean do nothing? Do you not love the dog? So anyway, I spent my time the following day looking through to be impressed, I must say. It turns out that it's the biggest, largest randomized controlled trial, multi-centered, concealed allocation, double-blind trial. It's the biggest ever vet study about this particular drug in this particular group of dogs. 45% of the population were King Charles Spaniels. Same age group as Missy, etc., 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 and I was like, "Yeah, okay, number needed to treat in relation to heart failure and you know mortality. Yeah, go for it. You can, she can have it." Wow, <laughs> gets a thumbs up. <laughs> I got some money back off the vet this week. I'm not even sure how. Thankfully, my wife stopped listening to the podcast, but um, I got eighty quid back. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to get myself a new pair of headphones for season three. So yeah, I've been watching the football. Obviously, one guaranteed way to lose our listeners in Wales, Scotland, and Ireland will be to say it's coming home. So I won't say it. I had a good chat today with Tracy Lyons of Pharmacy Declares on some green issues and so hopefully lined up some work and podcast chat for the future because we've chatted about sustainability a couple of times but I wanted to recommend a book I've been reading this week it's called The Octopus Man by Jasper Gibson Um, no relation and it's about a man who hears the voice of an octopus god in his head which sounds a bit odd but actually the book is a really well written book about schizophrenia and the drugs used to treat them and what's interesting is it's written from the point of view of the person with schizophrenia and the effect those drugs have on their emotions and how they behave as opposed to how we normally look at it which is how their behavior appears to us and so it's funny but harrowing as well and its message which i think is a really good one is about the over medicalization of mental health and how it's often treated for our benefit rather than the actual person so it's a bit eye-opening it's not my normal sort of book i'm normally reading terry pratchett and that sort of stuff so highly recommended that's the octopus god by um 
Jasper Gibson. Very good. The trial continues. Uh, the the, uh, the High Court thing I'm involved in has been going on the last couple of weeks. It's all about events between 2003 and 2010. And so I've been listening to all the other witnesses and expert witnesses recall events from that time. It's a bit like one of those nostalgia TV programmes, the 90s or the noughties. The history of prescribing 2003 to 2010 could easily be turned into a Netflix blockbuster. But the thing that really caught my eye this week watching and listening was the barrister's ability to ask great questions, and that's an obvious one, but their ability for critical appraisal, wow. If I could invite a barrister to the next session on critical appraisal that we do, if we could afford them, that would be um, that would be something very, very impressive. We should get one on the podcast next series. We did invite, uh, it wasn't a barrister, but some legal people to talk to pharmacists about not just negligence, but you're right, is they, they come at it from a completely different angle and, and it is fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. So we've got clinical negligence lawyers lined up for series three or four. A barrister is slightly... More expensive. Different. <laughs> yeah, more expensive. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Okay, well, it's an absolute pleasure for me to invite onto the Oral Apothecary podcast a colleague for many years when I worked up in Manchester. And I'm not just saying this, but somebody who I took a lot of inspiration from. And, you know, when you have a job and you skip and a jump and you leave the car parked because you're excited about going into work. And this was starting work at seven o'clock in the morning doing post-take ward rounds with Dr. Mark Holland, who is today's guest. Mark has spent more than 30 years toiling in the NHS as a, a geriatrician and an acute medicine consultant and has since moved into university as an associate professor at Bolton teaching the next generation around advanced clinical practice so in particular advanced nurse practitioners pharmacists physios and also some physician associates so he was an inspiration and I'm now going to take all that down by Mark by saying you are the first guest to have an IMDB profile <laughs> when I was looking to tell the lads some of the things that when you were the president of the Society for Acute Medicine, you will remember me talking to you sometimes over coffee, saying, you need to be careful when you're on the TV there, Mark, because I know you like to say it as it is. But you did have some great interviews on TV when you were the Society for Acute Medicine president. I couldn't find any, but I did (laughs) discover you have an IMDB page, which is normally for people who are actors and and things like that. So yeah, without further ado, very warm welcome onto the Oral Apostles the Cree podcast. How are you doing? No, thank you for the invite. It's great to be here. Everything's going well. What would you like to tell us about what's sort of like a big thing on your agenda right now? I guess the biggest thing at the moment is, oh goodness, this week it's the fact that we finished exams at the university. Thankfully, everyone passed. So that's big. And then over the summer, we're planning for next year with a big revamp of the courses. You know, COVID has it sort of helped us in many ways because um, out of adversity comes innovation. And one of the things that we done is all of these zoom lectures for the last 18 months but i've now realized that actually once we go back in the classroom in september uh, zoom is still going to be my friend so i've now got the ability to take all of the boring lectures that i do put them on zoom and when we move into the classroom we can start to do much more interactive stuff than we did before so that's the plan in the immediate short term is to revamp the courses and bring them up to speed i think it's called flipped learning i was just about to come in and say flipped learning there mark get the Compulsory is done so you can really engage with the learners on another level. Yeah, we can do more problem solving. We can do more questions. We can start to just go more deeply into concepts as opposed to what we do at the moment, which is, you know, all teaching is too heavy on PowerPoint. And as much as you try to introduce interaction and asking questions, etc., it just doesn't work online. But you do realise that with Zoom, you have got the ability to have that material there, you know, infinitum for the students students to look at it's it's all looking positive so mark given that you a big part of your chunk now is around you told me about the advanced clinical practice so you said you cover therapeutic shared decision making and clinical diagnostics you've got the whole breadth of different health professionals and as you will have listened on the podcast previously we've talked about non-medical prescribers so could you give us a feel for what you think are the strengths of the different professions on the advanced clinical practice around maybe shared decision making and therapeutics (laughs) that's a very controversial question what 
the students come at it from different backgrounds. So my average cohort is in the region of 25 to 30. And the vast majority of them will be from a nursing background. And so clearly with the independent prescribing, on those occasions, they're looking very much at taking it directly into their practice. And so most of them will be subspecialising already. They won't be generalists. A few of them are going off to work in the acute medicine unit and maybe the emergency department. Um, So it makes a big difference. And having worked with people on the ground who have um, been training in advanced clinical practice, you realise how much more efficient it makes having people who have got organisational memory and people who know how your systems work. And as you and I both know from when we worked at Withenshaw, having the right systems is important. We train pharmacists on our courses. The pharmacists have obviously already done master's degrees, most of them who join us. We don't like touching though, patients that is. You know, we've got different ones. We've got some from community background and some from hospital background. And I deal with them also with the modules that you've mentioned, but I also help them write their um, master's dissertations in their final year and the pharmacists have done some really splendid stuff especially stuff around medicines reviews in older people I mean they've really taken that sort of stuff to another level and the other big group that I have which has fascinated me more than any of the others because I've worked with all these other groups before but I've never worked closely with paramedics and the paramedics on my course are motivated that's to understate it they are competitive whatever you tell them to do they go away and do it tenfold they're just so so keen but you also learn so much from them when you talk with them as first responders and they go to people's homes the stories that they give about the use of medicines in the patients whose homes they go to are actually quite frightening you know what they find and you know the standard storage for medicines in this country is as we all know it is is just the plastic bag you know a bag for life is actually a bag for medicines Um, and everyone whoever they are everyone has a, a nice cream tub that's been washed out that they store their medicines in as well so yeah you do hear these frightening stories but I worked with some of them recently on a geriatric medicine module and actually it's making a big difference to their practice because we sort of worked and learned interactively and they're saying that now when they're going out to see people the stuff that they used to do before which would have been to take observations get a quick history they're now actually delving through the house looking for medicines and fitting together the story of the patient with the medicines and making sure that those two match because before they didn't realize you know that the medicines added so much to the history so yeah it's a really good interactive way to learn with people that's how I learned most I think from you is listening to you trying to get the story from that person who'd been admitted overnight and like you say it's understanding that everything is interlinked isn't it if you only work in your own little world you don't see the other side so yeah absolutely you just reminded me Mark I do need to uh, give a shout out to somebody uh, you're talking of exam boards and MSCs can I give a shout out to Hilary Hargreaves uh, been working with Hilary supervising her MSC just been awarded her distinction today so congratulations I know Hilary be listening in North Wales uh, and her her dissertation was on uh, non-medical prescribers and asthma, pharmacists in particular, and asthma reviews. And so the paramedics, Mark, I mentioned on last week's pod that my wife's a consultant in palliative medicine. And as you say, the paramedics are there at the sharp end. And I know that paramedics and palliative medicine is an area that will be developed even more over the next sort of five years as well. Again, and those stories of, I remember doing house visits to patients and you'd walk through the door and you'd, you'd, you'd step on something. You think, what's that? And it would be warfarin tablets. You know, you're actually stepping on the warfarin tablets. They're crunching under your feet. Yeah, but James, that's because they live near a big sewer. Yeah, well, that was a big part of um, what Steve and I used to do when we was at Withenshaw. We had a big thing about warfarin tablets because the patients never knew the doses. I'm sure it's the same with you guys, but all they ever knew was the colours. And so when we initiated uh, people on warfarin with DVTs, the two of us both agreed that we would only send them home on one milligram tablets until they were stabilised because that just couldn't go wrong. So we gave up giving out blues and pinks. and Yeah, don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember 15, 20 years ago, the oxygen contract used to be with community pharmacy. And so part of the role was going out to houses and delivering oxygen. And it went and it went, you know, central delivery through through the corporations but I always argued against it because what was lost was the fact that pharmacists were going into these people's homes and I can remember some of the things that I was helping people with I always remember well firstly who's going to get them some shopping on the way in because he used to bring them a toilet roll or whatever but who's going to help them with their medicines when I'm not visiting them every day because 
you know, we were going into really vulnerable people, really sick people, two or three times a week. And I think it was a really important part of their care and it just went. And I, and I think a lot of problems could maybe track back to that. I mean, I can tell you from my own experience, about a year and a half ago, my father passed away. He was very elderly. And I'd always been of the opinion that I would never interfere with his care. I've always found it very difficult dealing with other health professionals who come in and want to actually manage the care. So I always made a point of never managing his care. But once he had passed away and I had to um, empty things out, I found somewhere in the region almost about 10 new brown inhalers, completely brand new, which must have been worth a fortune. And I also found um, enough paracetamol opiate um, combinations to have funded a holiday abroad if I'd have gone on the street and sold it. But all of these things had accumulated over the years. And it was just massive, massive, massive volumes of meds. Yeah. And so I guess that's the same in every old person's house up and down the country. And again, I guess going forward, that's 